Hello everyone, today we're going to be going over the entire multiple choice section of the January 2023 Algebra 2 Regents exam. We're going to be starting off with question number one, which asks which expression is equal, equivalent to uh, x plus 2 squared minus 5, x plus 2 plus 6, right? So what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to combine like terms and then simplify this entire thing and then match it with one of those answer choices at the on the bottom. Right, so I'm going to quickly write this down for my own reference, x plus 2. Uh, plus 6 and then I'm going to start distributing right so I have x plus 2 uh, squared which is the same thing as saying that right so I'm going to multiply this out that's going to be x squared plus 2x right and then plus 2x so that's plus 4x and then 2 times 2 is 4 so plus 4 right here I'm going to distribute this negative 5 out so here I have negative 5x distribute this negative 5 to this 2 I have negative 10 right and I'm just going to write this plus 6 down because it, it, I have nothing else to combine it with next I'm going to combine like terms I have nothing to combine x squared with so I'm going to just write it down next thing I'm going to combine uh, 4x with negative 5x right uh, 4 plus negative 5 is negative 1 so I have enough with negative x right Next, I'm going to just combine uh, our 4 with our 6. That gives us plus 10. And then I'm going to combine it with our negative 10, so minus 10. Those two cancel out. I'm left with x squared minus x. Uh, now, don't worry. Even though it doesn't match any... Uh, you may be saying, oh, it doesn't match any of our answer choices. That's because we can factor this out, right? We can take this x out. The greatest common factor in x times x squared or x times x minus x is x. Right, so if we take out x, it's x minus one, x times x minus one, which is choice number one. Another way you could have done this problem was you could have said, we could have just said x equals two, or x equals three, right? And you could have plugged this plug this value in for each and every single uh, choice and see which choice, um, which value, or which solution from each choice matched up with the with the original equation. Uh, up top right so number two says nearest tenth the solution to the equation 4300 times e to the power of 0 0.07 x minus 123 is equal to 5000 is what well there's one or two ways you can do this right uh, the first way you can do this is you could just solve it algebraically so I'm, t I'm saying uh, add 123 to both sides then divide by 4300 right then take the natural log, na uh, log natural or natural log of both sides, right? Then divide everything by 0 0.07 and then set it equal to x. That's one way you could do this, but that's really confu uh, A lot of people can get caught up on that, right? Another way you can do this, and the way that probably the faster way you could do this is just graphing it, right? Remember that whenever it says solution, solution is the same thing as intersection, right? And uh, these are two different equations. We can have y is equal to 5,000. At the same way, we can have y is equal to uh, this, right? Uh, and we could just find the intersection of those two lines, and that's going to be our solution, right? Remember, solution is synonymous with intersection, or to say the same, they mean the same thing, right? So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to do that. So here I have 4,300 uh, times e to the power of 0 0.07x minus 123. Right, and I'm going to set the second equation equal to 5,000. I'm going to go into window, and I'm going to set my window. I'm going to set my uh, my y max to a value greater than 6,000. Oh, sorry, greater than 5,000. I'm just going to graph it. Right, so here are my two graphs, and right, right about here is going to be our intersection. So I'm going to go into second trace, right? Remember, second trace, and then I'm going to go into this menu. Right here, I'm going to go into intersect. First curve, press enter. Remember to draw your second curve after the intersection, and whenever it says guess, just uh, point the arrow to wherever you want to calculate the, the intersection. I'm going to press enter. It's going to say that when they intersect, our x value, right, or what x is equal to, uh, is roughly equal to 2.5, right? So I'm going to place 2.5 as our answer. Moving on to number three, it says the value of an automobile t years after it was purchased is given by the function v is equal to 38,000 times 0. 8, 4 to the power of t, which statement is true. Uh, this reminds me of the equation p uh, is equal to a, um, oh, sorry, a, <laughs> other way around, a, which is your total, is equal to p uh, 1 plus minus r uh, to the power of t. Remember that if this, if this value is less than 1, it's decaying. Or it's deprecating, depreciating, or it's decreasing, right? So it's going down, right? If it's less than one, it goes down. Is what I'm trying to say. If this is greater than one, 
it's going up it's appreciating increasing gaining all those sort of words right so if I look at this equation right here I notice that 0 0.84 is less than it's less than 1 so I know it's it, the value of the car is decreasing remember one of those D words it's going down right so I could have uh, eliminate anything that says increasing right and now I need to find what it's decreasing by well think about it right if it's decreasing and it's less than one, that means I'm subtract. If it's less than one, that means I have to take one, right? And then that means I have to subtract. I have to subtract our rate, right? So one minus r, our rate, is going to equal, or it's going to give us 0 0.84, right? If I solve for r, r is actually going to equal to 16, right? 16, uh, sorry, r is going to equal to 0 0.16 which is the same thing as uh, which is the same thing as saying 16%, right? So the value of car is decreased, the value of the car is decreasing by 16% each year, right? So number 4 says which function represents exponential decay? Just to not be confused with anything, I'm going to quickly just graph all of these, right? Um, sure, you can assign values, you can plug this in, you could just, you know, remember the formula of an exponential function. You could do all of that, but I think that the most safe way to do this is just to graph all of these four functions and see which one uh, is in the exponential decay shape. Remember that shape is uh, is something along the lines of this. It's going down really quick. It's starting from a very high number and in a, very, in a relatively short amount of time, it's decreasing very quickly, right? So that's dk. If we were talking about uh, exponential growth, right? It, it would start at a very low number and then increase to a very high number soon, right? So this is this is growth. Uh, so let's go graph that into our function or into our calculator. I'm just going to reset my zoom. So I'm going to press zoom uh, standard and now I'm going to graph it. So I'm going to write uh, 1 over 4 to the power of negative x and then I'm going to write 1.8 to the power of negative x. Then I'm going to write uh, 2.3 to the power of 2x. And then my last function, I'm going to write 4 to the power of x over 2, right? So 4 to the power of, oh, that's 1, sorry. 4 to the power of x over 2. I'm going to press graph and I'm going to look at the shapes, right? Remember we said that uh, for decay it has to go up from a very high value and then go down. Uh, whichever function is the red one shows that. That red function is 1.8 to the power of, of negative x, right? If I go into y equals, that's the function that, that it was assigned the color red, right? Um, so that's all. The, the easiest way to do this one and the way to avoid any, any uh, incorrect answer is simply just to graph it and then see whichever one shows the exponential decay function. I think that's number five. It says the expression x, minus, uh, x to the power of 4 minus 5x squared plus 4 plus 14 divided by x plus 2 is equivalent to what? Obviously, we're going to have to divide these two, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and set that up for us right here. Um, so since it's over x plus 2, we're dividing by x plus 2, so x plus 2 goes out. And I'm going to write this in our inside, right? So here I have x to the power of 4 plus, remember, 0x to the power of 3 minus 5x squared plus 4x plus 14. Remember that whatever goes inside, uh, remember that uh, whatever goes inside this has to be in decreasing order of power. So I, in this, I'm missing, I'm going from 4 to 2, right? I'm missing a 3. It should go 4, 3, 2, 1. I was missing that, so I had to add a placeholder. Now I could just divide it as usual. So how many times does x go into x to the power of 4? It goes x to the power of 3 times. Right, what's well, 2 times x to the power of 3? It's plus 2x cubed. Right, I'm going to subtract this. These turn out to be 0. This is negative 2x cubed. Right, I'm going to write down negative 5x squared here. How, many how much times does x go into negative 2x cubed? It goes into negative 2x squared times, right? So here I have negative 2x uh, cubed, right? They multiply into that. Here I have uh, 2 times negative x squared, which is negative 4x squared, right? I'm going to subtract these. Uh, this is going to turn into 0. Uh, this is going to turn um, into negative 
x squared. And if I just look at, at what my quotient is, right? Oh, oh my god. <laughs> That's really frustrating. Uh, I remember what it was, though. It was this, right? Anyways, I meant to highlight this. If I look at my quotient right here, I have x cubed minus 2x squared. Automatically, I see that number 1 is the answer because it's the only thing that has that negative 2x squared there, right? So if you want to save time on this test, you could just see that and uh, you could just choose that answer knowing that it's right, right? Um, so I'm just going to move on from this. I could have continued dividing all this, but really, once I see uh, that this is a unique answer, I'm going to keep it like that, right? Moving on to number six, this is the sum of the first 20 terms of the series. Uh, negative 2 plus 6 minus 8 plus 54, whatever, is what? Well, I have to, it's asking for the term of the series, right? And I need to find out if this is uh, geometric or arithmetic, right? Uh, off the bat, I can see this is geometric, right? Because to go to from 2 to negative 3, I have to multiply by negative 3 right then if i go to 6 to negative 18 i have to multiply by negative 3 and then i have to multiply by negative 3 right so our, our common ratio is negative 3 we're multiplying by negative 3 uh to each next term if you don't know how to do that if you don't know how to find the common ratio just take any two terms and divide them right so i could take 6 and i could divide it by negative 2 i would have gotten negative 3 right take two terms divide them and then you'll you'll, you'll find the, the common difference right or the common ratio. Next, now that I know that, I'm going to plug it into the to the uh, geometric sum of formula, which is S of n, which is our sum, is equal to the first term times 1 minus the rate or our, our common ratio, right, to the power of n terms, the number of terms, divided by 1 minus r, which is our common ratio, right? So let's just plug in our values. Uh, this is going to equal to a of 1. So a of 1, our first term, is going to be negative 2, right? So that's negative 2 times 1 minus the rate, right? So 1 minus the rate is 1 minus negative 3, right? And that negative 3 is raised to the path, to the number of, of terms, right? There's 20 terms. Uh, now we're dividing all this by 1 minus, right, our rate, which is uh, minus 3 again, right? It's a lot of parentheses, a lot of numbers. If we plug this into our calculator, we get uh, choice number 3 as our answer, which is pretty big. Number seven says, if uh, if f of x is equal to 2x to the power of 4 minus x to the power of 3 minus 16x plus 8, then f of 1 half uh, is equal to what? Right? So right here, it's saying that given this equation, when x is equal to uh, 1 over 2, what does y equal to? Right? So I'll, automatically, I have a graphing calculator, right? And if I have a graphing calculator, it means I can graph, graph this. Uh, so I would I would heavily suggest that you use it. That's how I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to graph uh, 2x to the power of 4 uh, minus x to the power of 3 minus 16x plus 8, right? And I'm going to just hit graph. That's our function right there. Next, what I'm going to do is it's asking me when x is 1 half, right? If I want to, if I want to ask my calculator what the graph equals is equal, what y is equal to when x is a specific value, I can press second and I can press calc, right? And I could just hit value, right? Once I press value, it's going to ask me what? And this is literally what our, our question is asking is, given this graph, what is the value of y when x is equal to one half or one of, or when f of one half is, right? So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to, I'm going to write one divided by two or one half, I'm going to press enter, right? So when x is one half, y is equal to zero, right? So automatically, I can eliminate 3 and 4, right? Because it's equal to 0. And all this means is, now, now, now we go into the second part, which says that 2x plus 1 or 2x minus 1 is a factor of x. Uh, all, this is, all this is asking is that which, whichever one of these expressions, if you plug in uh, 1 half as x is equal to 0, that's going to be choice number 2, right? If you look here, 2x minus 1 is equal to 0, and we solve for x, we have 2x is equal to 1 x is equal to 1 half, right? Or if I plug in 1 half to that, 2 times 1 over 2 minus 1 is equal to 0. 2 times 1 half is 1. 1 minus 1 is equal to 0, right? So this is a factor, right? So whenever you see factor, that means that, uh, that, means that uh, it makes the equation equal to 0, right? Or it goes into x with 0 remainders, which means that uh, it's equal to 0. Um, that when f is this value, it's equal to 0, that's all, right? If we had this value right here, 2x plus 1, and we plugged in 1 half, that would give us 2, not 0, right? So 
Moving on to number eight, it says that if six minus k i squared is equal to 27 minus 36 i, then the value of k is what? This one's pretty tricky, uh, but there is a way, it's a pretty manageable way to tackle this. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to expand 6 minus k i uh, squared, right? So I'm just going to rewrite this twice. Right, so 6 times 6 is 36, right? 6 times negative k i is equal to negative 6 k i. Right, negative ki times 6, same thing as saying negative 6ki. And in here we have uh, negative ki times negative ki, which is equal to positive k squared, right, times i squared, right? Remember that i is equal to negative uh, radical 1, right? So if we square this, same thing as saying square the squared. Ne radical negative 1 squared, right? And and whenever you square a radical, they cancel out. So really, uh, radical i, uh, sorry, i squared, right, is the same thing as saying negative 1, right? So here, if I combine like terms, I have a 36 minus 12 k i uh, minus k squared, right? Because if this is equal to negative 1, negative 1 times k squared is equal to negative k squared, right? So that's this side done. I'm going to set this equal to 27 minus 36i and then I'm going to see um, which value makes these two equal right so let's just think about it right I know that I can split this into two ways right I have I have imaginary numbers right imaginary values uh, which which I'll put in green so 12ki that's an imaginary value and 36i, those are two imaginary values. And then I have my real values, which I'm going to put in yellow. 36 minus k squared and 27, right? So if I want to solve for k, I can set either one of these equal to each other, right? I'm just going to set a negative 12ki equal to negative 36i equal to each other, right? Whatever is in yellow, you set equal to each other. Whatever is in green, you set equal to each other. The thing is you keep imaginaries with imaginaries, right? As I did here, and you keep uh, real with real, and you just solve like that, right? So here I have negative 12 ki is equal to negative 36 i. You just divide by three on both sides. Uh, sorry, divide by negative 12 on both sides, you get ki is equal to um, three i. Right, you could you could just factor out i on both sides. You get k, or you can just divide uh, divide by i on both sides. Actually, you get k is equal to three. Boom, and then you get three. Right, so that so so what I pretty much what I did here is I took all my green values, right, or all my imaginary values, and I just set them equal to each other, and I solve for k. Right, you could do the same thing, but for your real values, I'll show you that right here. Thirty six minus k squared is equal to twenty seven. Uh, I can add k squared on both sides, right? And I can subtract 27 on both sides. 36 minus 27 is equal to k squared. I can get 9 is equal to k squared. And then if I take the square root of both sides, I get 3 is equal to k. So same thing. I got the same answer. But if I but here, the only difference was I was using my real values, right? So in summary, all you have to do to really solve this uh, solve this problem is to expand it, right? Expand it, expand both sides fully, and then set and then group the real and imaginary imaginary sides together, and that's it. And just solve for them independently of one another. We ask number nine. It asks us what's the solution set to the equation x plus two over x plus x over 3 is equal to 2x squared plus 6 over 3x. So straight off the bat, I could eliminate uh, number 2 and 4, right? Because why? Well, because it's saying that one possible value of x is 0. That's obviously wrong because if we just plug this in, right, we, that the first thing we see, right, x plus 2 over 0, we can't have that. There's no such thing as a fraction over 0. Um, for example, if I were just plug this into my calculator, of 8 divided by 0, right? That gives me an error. You can never divide by 0, right? So whatever this is, it cannot be 0. x can never be 0. And that just leaves us with the choice of either negative 3 or 3. I'm just going to solve this because it's not that hard, uh, right? So here I have x plus 2 over 3, oh, over x.
here I have x over 3, and this is equal to 2x squared plus 6 over 3x, right? Uh, the greatest common factor between all of this is going to be 3x, right? So I'm going to multiply this side by 3 over 3. I'm going to multiply this side by x over x. I'm left with um, 3x plus 2 over 3x um, plus x squared over 3x is equal to 2x squared over 6. Oh, sorry, oh, 2x squared plus 6 over 3x. Right, I'm going to multiply all everything by 3x just to cancel out the, uh, the, the, um, the denominators. And I'm just going to be left with 3x plus 2 plus x squared is equal to 2x squared plus 6. I'm going to factor this out. Uh, 3 times x is 3x. 3 times 2 is plus 6. Right, next thing, uh, next thing's up, I'm gonna uh, just subtract six from both sides. Those are gonna cancel out. I'm left with three, uh, let me just write it up here. I'm, I'm gonna be left with three x plus x squared is equal to two x uh, squared. Obviously the, uh, the next uh, thing that I have to do is just subtract x squared from both sides. I'm gonna be left with three x is equal to uh, x squared, right? 0 is equal to x squared minus 3x. I can factor out the x. 0 is equal 0 is equal to factor out the x. x minus 3, right? So if x minus 3 is equal to 0, x has to equal to 3, right? So 3 is going to be our answer. If I plug in 3 here, 3 minus 3 is 0. x times 0 is 0. If I plug in negative 3 here, negative 3 minus 3 is negative 6. That's 0 is not equal to negative 6. Sorry, negative 6x, right? So that's how you would solve this. Otherwise, you could have we could have literally just plugged in either negative 3 or 3, and whichever one was, was actually made this made this equation true would have been um, would have been the right answer, right? So number 10 has says that how many real solutions exist for this system of equation below? Remember we have the word solutions here. All that means. All that, I don't know why I just did that, but all that means is, uh, whoa, um, intersection, right? Intersections or points of points of intersections, uh, for the graph. I, I, I know we used that term, uh, in a, in a previous problem, right? So we're going to see how many times this intersects and then then that, though, that amount of number is going to be what our intersections are, right? Or, or how many solutions are. That's what's going to define it. So the easiest way to do this is just graph it, right? They, they literally gave us two y equals. And here we have an entire, we have an entire, you know, array of things that we can set y equal to. So I'm just going to do that, right? So for things first, 1 over 4, x minus 8. Boom, I just graph that, right? Second thing I have to graph, 1 over 2. 2x squared plus 2x. I graph that too, right? Next, I can go into uh, and go to graph, and I graph them, right? And so far, I see absolutely no intersection between them. I see no points at which they cross. Maybe, well, maybe it's just because I'm not zoomed out enough, right? So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to zoom out just to be extra sure. I'm going to zoom out again. Yeah, these two never never ever touch right and because they never intersect they have no points at intersections they're going to be zero solutions right because there's zero times that they intersect number 11 says which equation represents a polynomial identity right uh answer is going to equal uh, answer is going to be two right remember that automatically it's just always wrong x plus y cubed is not equal to x cubed plus y cubed right uh, i think we all learned this in math class or in al actually algebra 2 uh, this is this is what that simplifies into but if you're not too sure uh just just you could literally uh you could have logic this one uh this one out right because think about it if i'm going to if i'm, if I'm going to factor this out right i'm gonna i'm gonna have to end up multiplying x times x cubed, right? The times x squared, that would get me x cubed, right? But then at some point, I'm going to have to multiply positive y by negative y squared. And that's going to give us that's that would give me negative y cubed, right? But here it's saying that that's equal to positive y cubed. 
So how can how can that be equivalent when when inevitably I'm gonna get negative y cubed and I'm never I'm not and I'm never gonna be able to combine like terms to make that positive one positive y cubed, right? Same thing goes for this one. I'm gonna I'm gonna end up multiplying x by y squared. I'm gonna get y x cubed. But same problem here. I'm gonna have to multiply negative y by positive y squared. I'm gonna get negative y cubed at our end, right? And so that's how you know that, right? And then finally, uh, for this one, we don't, we never have that issue, right? Because here I can multiply this x by this x squared. I'm going to get x cubed, and inevitably, inevitably, when I multiply, I'm going to have a bunch of other terms, right? But at the end, I'm going to multiply this y by this y squared. I'm going to have plus y cubed, right? And that's once again how we how we see that. If you didn't want to do that, uh, you could have. Another way you could have do this, you could have just literally just expanded all of this until you found one that matches, or you could have assigned values to x and y, and that's all. all right, moving on to number 12, it says given that x is greater than 0, the expression x to the power of 1 fifth divided by x to the power of 1 half can be rewritten as what? Well, first off, uh, you have to remember a, a key rule, a to the power of b over a to the power of c is the same thing as saying a to the power of b minus c, right? So let's go, let's go express that, right? x to the power of one fifth divided by x to the power of one half is equal to x to the power of one fifth minus one half, right? Uh, let's just go see what um, one fifth minus one half is. Sorry, it's pretty late. I don't want to really do that. Same thing as saying negative. This is the same thing as saying x to the power of negative three over ten. Right, so whenever you have a negative exponent, you always uh, write that underneath one. Right, so if we have x to the power of negative three over ten, that's the same thing as saying one over x to the power of three over ten. Remember the uh, remember this this rule, uh, a to the power of negative one. The same thing as saying uh, one over a to the power of, to the power of one. Right, so now we're left with one over x to the power of three over ten. Right. Remember that um, whatever is your numerator is what you're going to raise it by, and whatever is whatever your uh, your denominator is is whatever you're rooting it by. Right. So here we're gonna have x x cubed, right? But we're gonna root it uh, by ten, right? So really, we're gonna have one over ten root x cubed. That's gonna be our answer answer choice number three, right? So number 13 says that uh, a cyclist pedals a bike at a rate of 60 revolutions per minute. The height h of the pedal at t time second t at time t in seconds is plotted below. The function can be modeled by five sine kt, where k is equal to what? Right. So whenever you have a sine graph, right, it really follows the same format. Here you have a sine uh, b x plus c plus d. Right. A is your amplitude. B is your uh, is is going to be uh, equal to to uh, your period when you when you uh, divide it by two pi, right? Here, this is, this is your same value as k, right? C is going to be your shift left slash right, and D is going to be your vertical. Right, so. That's pretty much the format that that all of them, right? Here you have your amplitude. Here you have, uh, here you have your k or or your frequency. Here you have your shift left or right, and here you have your vertical shift, right? So all it's asking is where, it, all all it's asking us, is is for our, our b value, right? And there's there's a there's a very important formula. It says that our period is equal to two pi over b. Right, or in this case, our period is equal to two pi over k. Right, if we want to assign that value of k, all we have to do is solve for k. Right, so what is a period? A period is the amount of time required to complete one full cycle. Right, remember that frequency is cycles per second, right? And that's hertz, right? Here we're asking for our period, which is the time required to, to do a full cycle, right? Remember, a full cycle is one where we start 
from from zero or we start from one we rise all the way up we rise all the way down and then we end up back where we started right so in this case because it's a sine wave right we start from zero we rise all the way up to our first peak we we go all the way down to our second peak once we get our second peak we go all the way up and this is going to be one one full cycle complete a one full cycle completed right and it only took us one second right so here our period is actually one so we're going to set one equal to two pi over over k k is equal to two pi that's all we have to do here right moving on to number 14 it says which statement about data collection is most apt most accurate we could just logic this out it says the survey about parenting styles is given to every 10th student entering the library will provide unbiased results uh this will provide biased results because it's only only measuring people who enter libraries uh maybe the maybe the students in the library will say that their parents suck for making them go to the library maybe the students will say that their parents are lovely because they they, they make them go to the library right but this will definitely uh give us biased results because it's limiting the uh, the uh, where we're getting our data from to a specific location and a specific group of people who go to that location, right? Number two says an observational study allows a researcher to, to develop the cause of an outcome, right? Uh, just because you see something doesn't mean you know that you know, why that specific thing uh, happens. Sometimes there are extenuating circumstances that you don't see. Uh, just because you see a car speeding doesn't mean you know why it's speeding, right? Um, just because you know you see someone running doesn't mean you know why they're running. Same thing. Number three says margin of error increases as sample size increases. That's just wrong. Margin of error increases as, sorry, margin of error decreases, right, as the sample size increases. And number four is our only, only right choice just because it's left out of all the other choices, but also because it says that a survey collected a random sample of students in a, in a school can be used to represent opinions about the school population. This one makes the most sense, right? You're asking about about opinions of the school population, right? And then you're selecting a random sample of students in a school, right? You're asking about people who, you're asking about a school and then you're asking people who go to a school, you're asking them randomly and you have a big sample, right? So this is, the, this is going to give you the most unbiased and accurate data. Number 15 says, if f of x is equal to 1 half x plus 2, then the inverse function is equal to what? Right, this is the same thing as saying 1 is equal to 1 half x plus, y is equal to 1 half x plus 2. If you ever want to find the inverse function, you just flip the x and the y values, right? So uh, if we flip this, it's going to be well, x is equal to 1 half y plus 2. You can literally just flip the values around. Next, what we're going to have to do is just solve, uh, put this in terms of y, right? Uh, so... Sorry, I wrote this pretty sloppily. Let me just rewrite that for my own sake. X is equal to one half uh, times Y plus two, right? So I'm gonna subtract two from both sides. I have X minus two is, e is equal to one half times Y or Y over two. I'm gonna multiply by two on both sides, two over one on both sides to cancel it out, just get Y on its own, right? So here I have um, Y is equal to uh, 2 over 1 times x minus 2. That's the same thing as saying y is equal to 2x minus 4 over, uh, over 1, right? So the inverse function is actually uh, going to give equal to 2x minus 4, which is right there, right? And whenever you see f of negative 1, the same thing saying inverse. So all you have to do for this is just swap the x and y values and then just solve for y from, from that point. So number 16 says, uh, given f of x is equal to 4x minus x cubed minus 6x squared, which values of x will f of x be greater than 0? Or which values of x will y be greater than 0, right? So obviously, uh, we have a graphing calculator. It gives us a graph. Let's graph it, right? So let's go into y equals. Let's clear our other graphs, and let's go put it in. x to the power of 4. Uh, minus x to the power of 3 minus 6x squared, right? And if I hit graph, I'm going to go ahead into uh, zoom. I'm going to press zoom standard to reset it. Here we go, right? So obviously, um, we're going to read this from left to right, right? So uh, we go, we're going to infinity, right? 
at this point we're going to infinity, right? And then we're, as we approach, as we as our x value increases, our y value begins to decrease. It decreases all the way down, and then at a certain point, it begins to increase again, right? So if we go into our table, we can pretty much see this a lot better, right? So here's our table, right? It gives us all our values. So obviously, as x is, so it's asking what values of x, uh, of y will, will x, x which value of sorry i'm so sorry it's really late right now but which value of x will give you a y value that's greater than zero right so here we have x negative 18 these are all greater than zero right these are all greater than zero then we hit neg x equals negative two right so x equals negative two and then our y is now uh <coughs> smaller than zero right so we know that x cannot equal to negative 2, right? So x has to be less than, has to be less than negative 2, right? To make this, to make this true, right? So, uh, so, we, so we, we, don't, we don't know that that's the only choice now, right? So here we can see that when x is negative 1, it's negative 4. And then when x is 0, it's 0. When x is 1, it's negative 6, right? So all of these aren't fulfilling anything. But when x turns back into 4, it once again, um, once again, we're then increasing to a value that's that's actually uh, greater, greater than, than 0, right? And that happens... That happens when x is greater than three, right? Because when x is when x is three it doesn't make sense, right? But when x is greater than three, when x is four, right? Once again, our values begin to increase, right? And we're, our values are no longer below zero, right? So it has to be that x is is greater than three, right? So two reflects this, right? X has to be less than negative two, and x x has to be greater than three, right? So easiest way to do that, just plug it into your calculator, go into the graph, and then see which values, right? 17 says, which, appro which approximate values of x will log x plus five equal to x, the absolute value of x minus one minus three, right? So once again, we're look, we, we, over here, we have two equations, right? We have log x plus five, and we have this set equal to the absolute value of x minus 1 equal 3, right? And we want to know the value that they're equal to, right? Otherwise, we want to know the solution. The solution set or the x values which they're equal to each other, right? They give us two functions, so let's just graph it in our calculator, right? This is a very, this is a calculator heavy test. That was a horrible highlight, so sorry. I'm just going to go ahead and highlight those two. Go back into draw. So... Here we have log x plus 5, so I'm going to go ahead and, and graph that, right? So here, log x plus 5, right? So that's our first one. Here we have the absolute value of x minus 1 minus 3, right? So I'm going to go here. I'm going to go into math. Absolute value, x minus 1. Here's plus 3. Sorry, minus 3. And I'm going to hit graph. So out of, off the bat, I see that they intersect right at two points, right? So whichever says five only and whichever gives me only one, a solution I'm going to cross out, so that's four. And next, all I'm going to have to do is I'm going to calculate. I'm going to go press second calculate or second trace, and I'm going to go into intersect, and I'm just going to find where they intersect, right? So here, I'm going to set my first value before they intersect, right? Enter. I'm going to press my second curve after they intersect, right? And I'm going to find, I'm going to put guess over the intersection I want to find, right? So the first intersection is negative, negative 2.41, right? That's the first intersection. Next, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to try to find the second intersection, right? So I'm going to go trace calculate. I'm going to go into intersect. And here, press enter. Press enter after they intersect. And I'm going to over guess. This time, I'm going to write our. I'm going to put our guess over the second intersection, right? I'm going to press enter, and it's going to calculate that as five, right? So, which which choice matches this? It's choice number three, negative two, two point four one comma five, right? Eighteen says consider the cube a cubic 
polynomial with the characteristics below. What does cubic polynomial mean? It means that the highest power is x cubed. It's raised to x to the power of 3. And it's saying that x has exactly one real root, and it's saying that as x, in, as x approaches infinity, right, our f of x or our y approaches negative infinities, right? So that means that uh, we're going to have to go down, right? Uh, we're going to have one of these uh, funny looking functions, right, which, which which starts going up but then ends up going down, right? So here it's saying that given a is greater than zero and given b is is uh, is also greater than zero, which equation represents a cubic polynomial with these characteristics? Well, if you remember uh, which, which coefficient would give you this, right, it, you can have a coefficient of negative a negative number right outside your your x cubed value right so um, the only one that will give you a negative coefficient outside the x cubed value is going to uh, is going to be choice number number two right also another way you could have done this was you could literally just said that a is equal to two b is equal to three you could have plugged these numbers into the into the equation. You could have graphed it, and whenever whichever one satisfied uh, these parameters, we would have known that that's our that's our real answer, or that's that's the correct answer, right? I'm gonna go do that. What I just said uh, right now, right? So I said that a is equal to two, so I'm gonna go two minus x, right? Two minus x times x squared plus three. I'm gonna press graph. Look, right. Was that not the funny shape that I said it would be, right? It's going to go like that, right? So as x approaches infinity, which is which is exactly this way, right? The y is going to approach negative infinity, which means it's going down, right? If I go into table, as x increases, as x approaches infinity, look, that y is approaching negative infinity. If I go back into graph, and then what? It's saying that it has to have one, exactly one real root, right? Real root, root just means that... Uh, x intercept so it only has one x intercept it crosses the x axis only one time does it yeah it only crosses the x axis one time i can zoom out right and i'm going to see that it's only going to cross it uh one time so moving on to number 19, it says that betty conducted a survey of her class to see if they like pizza she got 200 responses blah 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 right it's asking us consider that Considering the middle 95% of data, what is the margin of error for the simulation? The margin of error is always going to be uh, two times uh, standard uh, the standard deviation, right? So two times SD. Standard deviation is 0 0.035, so I'm just going to write two times 0 0.035. I'm going to get 0 0.07 as my answer. I'm going to move on, right? So remember that margin of error is mo is equal to 2 sd uh, number 20 says if cosine a is equal to root 5 over 3 and tangent a is less than 0 what is the value of sine a right so first things first i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to draw this quadrant right the way i like to i like to uh, remember this is at stuyvesant they cheat because because you know who knows here it's going to say that all of them are positive. Here it says that sine is the only thing that's positive. Here it says that tan, and here it says cosine, right? So if we look here, sine is the only thing that's positive, right? Here we have everything is positive. Here's cosine, the only thing that's positive. It's saying that it's saying that uh, sine, cosine a, right? is radical 5 over 3, right? So cosine A is positive. So our solution can fall either in quadrant in these two quadrants, right? But we know that tan is negative, right? And if tan is is uh, sine over cosine, right? Uh, or cosine over sine, uh, it, it's probably sine over cosine, right? Uh, then then what we know is that is that if, if it's negative, that means that that means that our value of sine has to be negative, right? And if our sine is negative, that means that it falls in, in this quadrant, this third quadrant, right? Uh, this third quadrant where, si where cosine is equal to um, positive, where, where our cosine is positive, but, but our, but our um, sine is negative, right? Remember that cosine cosine is the x-axis, 
and sine is our y-axis. Here we know that our sine is definitely going to be um, negative, right? So we could automatically eliminate choice, choices 1 and 4 because they're not negative, and now we can just solve it as usual, right? Now that we know it, what, what uh, sine it's going to be, right? So I'm just going to assign this this is the, val uh, the value of angle A, right? I know that this is our opposite, this is our hypotenuse, uh, sorry, this is our hypotenuse, and this is our adjacent. Next, I know that, remember Sokotoa? Right? So, uh, sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So if, if cosine is equal to root 5 over 3, that means our, that our adjacent is going to equal to root 5, right? And that's root 5 divided by our hypotenuse, which is 3, right? So root 5 over 3. Great. So now all we have to do, we know that these rules only apply to right triangles. I can use the Pythagorean theorem. To, to calculate this, remember a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared, right? So here I have a, which I'm just gonna get radical five squared plus b squared is equal to nine. That's five plus b squared is equal to three squared, which is just, which is nine minus five on both sides. I have b squared is equal to four. That means that b is equal to two, right? So this is equal to two. Now I said that sine Right, sine A, sine is going to equal to opposite over hypotenuse, right? So the opposite is 2. So that's 2 over a hypotenuse, which is 3, right? So 2 thirds. And remember, uh, so we could eliminate answer choice 2. Now, if we didn't do this at side A cheat, right? And, we, and if we didn't determine that it fell, fell under this quadrant, if we didn't know that our, that our uh, sine would be negative, we would have chosen 2 over 3, right? But really, it's negative 2 over 3 because over here we, we knew that our sine. Uh, was negative. So moving on to number 21, it says a tree farm initially has 150 trees. If 20% of the trees are cut down and 80 seedlings are planted, which recursive formula, keyword recursive formula, models the number of trees A of n after n years, right? So if it's a recursive formula, that means we're adding the previous term to the next term. Right, and that means that our equation is always going to have a of n minus one, right? Because this calculates for the previous term. So next, the only thing we have to do is just see whichever value in the parentheses is correct. This um, this is a lot like the uh, a is equal to p plus minus r. Uh, sorry, <laughs> so sorry. A is equal to p times uh, 1 plus minus r to the power of t. That's a lot like this, right? Here it's saying that 20% of the trees are cut down, so our rate is going to be 1 minus 0 0.2, right? So if 20% of the trees are cut down, if 0 0.2 are going away, that means that 0 0.8 are remaining after each successive, successing year. So that's all. Right. So two things, right? Remember this formula and remember that if, if they're being cut down, right? It literally says down, right? So down means we're subtracting and we're subtracting by that 20%. That's all. If it says that 20% are remaining, then obviously uh, we have to, it will, it will be one. But since 80% are remaining after 20% are cut down, it's answer choice number two. Number 22 says, which equation represents a parabola with a focus of four comma three, sorry, 4 comma minus 3 in the directrix of y is equal to 1, right? So let's just go ahead and sketch this out right here. So I'm going to say that this is 4, right? And now I'm going to say this is negative 3, right? So if our focus is 4 comma negative 3, that's our focus, right? And if our directrix is y equals 1, it's just going to be the straight line right here. Now the thing is, the thing about this Right, here's our focus and here's our directrix. Our, our parabola is going to be the midpoint between the, these two, right? Our parabola is, the vertex of our parabola is going to travel right directly dead set between these two, right? So between a y value of 1 and between a value of, of, negative, of negative 3, right? And we know that the distance between this, this vertex, right, and the directrix is going to be p, Right, and the distance between that and our focus is also going to be p. Right, so first off, let's just calculate the distance between uh, uh, our 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 um, our directrix 
and our vertex, and let's divide it by 2, right? So to go from 1 minus negative 3, right, that's going to give 4. So there's 4. So the distance between this directrix, right, this directrix, and this focus, right, is going to be 4. There's 4 units, right? And if 2p is equal to 4, our p-value has to equal to 2, right? And that means that, that our vertex is going to fall in 1 minus 2 or negative 1, right? So our vertex is going to be negative 1. Next, right? So automatically, we can start eliminating choices, right? We know that the formula is x minus h squared is equal to 4p y minus k, right? And our vertex is equal to h comma k, right? Now, we just said that our vertex, right, the y value of our vertex is going to be negative 1, right? So which choice matches that? Well, obviously, it's going to be choice number 4. That's the only choice that matches this, right? Just think about it, right? If we say, if we said that, um, that there's a distance of, of, uh, of 4 in between here, and if 4 is equal to 2p and p is equal to 2, that means we have to go, we have to go down 2 units. Down 2 units from 1 is negative 1, right? That means that our k value is equal to negative 1, right? And if we have y minus k, y minus negative 1 is equal to the same thing as saying y plus 1. And that's the only value that has y plus 1 there, right? Number 23 says Mia has a student loan that is in deferment and that she does not need to make payments right now. The balance of her loan account during her deferment can be represented by the function f of x is equal to 35,000 times 1.0325 to the power of x, where x is the number of years since the deferment began. If the bank decides to calculate her balance showing a monthly growth rate, approximately uh, an approximately equivalent function would be which of the following, right? So right here, I have a monthly growth rate, and I'm thinking about one thing, and that's this formula. Right, so I have a is equal to p, right? One, oh well, I did not mean to write that. Here, one plus minus uh, r over n times t over n, right? And here is n is the amount of times times compounded, right? So. Here, uh, we know that it, they're trying to calculate a monthly growth rate, right? Which means that they're compounding it monthly, right? Monthly. That's, that's the, that is the key term here. So think about it. If x is the number of years, right? Then we have to have 12x because there's 12 months in one year. Right? And if this is in terms of a monthly growth rate, that means that we have to multiply each month x by the number of months, right? If x is the number of years, right, there's 12 months per year, that means we have 12x or, or 12y, right? We can't have x over 12, right? Because that, that that's saying that in one year, that, that's saying that one year is actually equal to 1 12. No, one year is, is not 1 over 12 months, one year is 12 months, right? 12 per 1, right? So that's going to give us one uh, either, either choice of 1 or 3. Just just by knowing how many months are in a year, you can you could whittle this down to 50 chance, right? 50-50 50, 50, 50 if, if you still don't know how to do it, right? The second thing is that if and if we're compounding this by month monthly, right? That means that we can't use the annual rate, right? This is the annual rate. This is in terms of x years, right? This is using years. Why are we using the year percentage when we're calculating by it by months, right? So obviously, number one is going to be the right answer because you can't use this yearly rate per monthly, right? Whatever your rate is per year, you're going to have to divide this by 12 if you want to, if you want to calculate it per month, right? The only thing that shows that is choice, uh, choice number one. One, right? Otherwise, you could have just plugged it into this formula. A is equal to P, right? Our P is uh, P value is three three thousand five uh, thirty five thousand dollars. One plus minus. Uh, sorry, just and and then we could have just had. One point oh three two five over twelve to the power of, of um, time, right? Which is years. One. Over, twelve, right? 
uh, the only thing we we would have had to modify here was instead of saying uh, that's one every twelve, uh, one over twelve, we just have twelve x, right? So uh, that that's all, right? That's pretty much how you do it. Uh, just really the really the trick here. You didn't even need to know that problem. Uh, all you would have need to know is that there's 12 months in the year, right? That's why we have that 12x. And we also would have need to know that the rate per month is way smaller than the rate per year. Moving on to number 24, last problem. It says, which graph shows a quadratic function with two imaginary zeros? Quadratic function is something that either uh, goes up like that in the U shape or goes down in the N shape. That's a quadratic function. So knowing that we could eliminate number choice, choice three and choice four. This is not quadratic, right? Quadratic either opens up, opens down. If it opens left to right, that's something else, right? And here, this isn't quadratic because it has this little squiggle, right? That's not a that's not a U shape. It goes up, up, and it has no no sort of curves at all, right? So now we're left with uh, either choice one or two. It says it has two imaginary zeros. Imaginary zeros meaning that it means that it never uh, crosses the x axis. Literally, that's all, right? Here we see that it touches the x-axis, which is the same thing as crossing it. It touches it, right? I'll go ahead and, and I'll modify my my my, uh, my solution. Never crosses or touches the x-axis. Right here, this is the only function that's quadratic, meaning that it's either an upside down u or a regular u, right? And that uh, that never touches the x-axis, right? So that's all 24. So that's the entire multiple choice section gone over in this one video. If you have any questions, please feel free to let them uh, let me uh, write them down in the comments. If you like this, if you like what you saw in this video, feel free to leave a like. And if you want more content like this, feel free uh, to subscribe. I'm going to be going over uh, like uh, probably another four tests like this uh, before the actual algebra two readings exam. So keep, I'll keep you all posted. So that being said, I hope you have a nice night. Goodbye.